Uh, Christ's life and work can be summarized in five necessary stages or events. If you think about this, and maybe you're thinking, what are those stages or events? Charles Spurgeon calls this the ladder of lights that begins on earth and reaches into heaven. Well, they are, as I prayed, they are the coming of Jesus in human form, uh, which is phenomenal uh, if you think about it, that he would be ever united to us, uh, his image bearers. And he came uh, uh, and was born of a virgin. He then lived, second stage, he lived a perfect life so that when you believe in Christ, his life, his perfect life counts for your perfect life. So your obedience, uh, it's not your righteousness, but it's his righteousness that we received for his perfect life lived. And then we notice the cross where he died to make atonement for sin for you and for me. But he did not stay in the grave because he rose again on the third day and showed his power over sin and death, showing that his sacrifice was acceptable to God. But that's four stages. And quite often we forget there is one more necessary stage in the process of Jesus' life and work. And that is his ascension. Uh, He did not stay on this earth, but he has ascended into heaven and Uh, If you know the scriptures, in John 20, 17, uh, we find that Mary is weeping outside the tomb of Jesus. Where have they put the body of Jesus? You know the beautiful words that Jesus says, Mary. And she goes, Rabboni, teacher. And then she perhaps lunged for him to grab hold of him. And he said these words, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. This is interesting, isn't it? Um, Basically saying, hold on, Mary. My work is not complete until I make it to the Father. Before we forget about Easter for another year, let us not leave Jesus having risen from the tomb, but let us bring him or remember him as one who has been raised from the dead, but has ascended to the Father. Let's talk about for a moment the ascension. And according to Alistair Begg, Paul Washer, this is one of the most neglected aspects of Christ's ministry. So we're going to look at the ascension. Three aspects of that will be, and you can see it in your, the outline of your notes, the ascension observed, the ascension explained, and the ascension applied. Very simple. The ascension observed. And if you look at Acts 1, 1, what do we see here? In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with, with all that Jesus began to do and teach. Who is this that is speaking to Theophilus? Well, this is none other than uh, the, Paul's physician, Luke, Dr. Luke, who, as you would expect, wrote the Gospel of Luke. And he wrote the Gospel of Luke as his first account of Jesus' work on this earth. And now he writes about Jesus' uh, ministry. And, oh, sorry, uh, Jesus' ministry through his people now on earth and one thing with a doctor you can expect that he is trained for detail for detail so Theophilus has been taught certain things and now Luke comes and says I want to write to you to explain what you what has been taught and for you to believe that and um and then but but noticing that Luke is a doctor uh, unlike the doctor I read about this week who uh, took, uh, who operated on a patient for prostate cancer, uh, stitched him up. The patient uh, wasn't healing, so the uh, patient went back to the doctor and the doctor opened up the wound and found 16 implements that he had left in the wound of the patient. No doubt that is a, uh, um, a unique situation, such as gauze and that sort of thing. So they cleared all that out. But our doctor, Dr. Luke, is a man who is trained for accuracy. And so number of things that we can look at with the ascension is that when, when did the ascension of Christ, Christ happen? Well, we find in verses 2a and 3, until the day when he was taken up, verse 3, he presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. His ascension occurred after 40 days after he rose again, 
of which time he presented himself with many proofs that he was indeed, and we, um, Serge read those. He said, look, this is flesh and bone. Uh, this is not just a spirit. And so we see that it's 40 days after, um, after he rose again. When was, where was the ascension? Well, if you turn over, and we'll flip between these, Luke chapter 24, verse 50 we find that it was near Bethany when then he led them out as far as Bethany and lifted up his hands and blessed them. Let's try and paint the picture of what must have happened at this time. Perhaps, G- now thinking, Bethany is on the, out the, on the Mount of Olives and there is, a num- there is um, a certain events that occurred on the, Mount, on the Mount of Olives. If you remember, Jesus... Um, on the night that he was betrayed, was in the upper room. Uh, we we uh, spoke about this at Easter. He was in the upper room and discussing with the disciples. And then they left the upper room. They traversed down the Kidron Valley up into the Garden of Gethsemane. And so perhaps, most likely, they could have been in the upper room again. He walked down that same path, probably one path, straight past the Garden of Gethsemane. What would they have felt at this time? Having walking now with the resurrected Christ, looking perhaps at that garden and remembering how they slept for sorrow. And now they are, now they are walking with Christ, um, the, the having resurrected Christ, who still has the nail prints in his hands, but is very much alive. What must have gone through their mind, uh, it no doubt gave them uh, hope, for the future, to realize that the times of trial are only temporary with the Lord. And I think that can be said of our times of trial as well. As he goes forward past this time of trial, he keeps going over the back of uh, the Mount of Olives. What else happened on the Mount of Olives near Bethany? Well, Lazarus was raised from the dead. When he wept over Lazarus, uh, his beloved um, friend, he spent many times with Mary, uh, Martha, and Lazarus also. It's interesting, when someone leaves, or I- leaves on a journey or is going to die, quite often they will go and revisit these wonderful events of their past. And I remember before I came to uh, America um, here a year ago, uh, just about a year ago, um, one thing I wanted to do was go to my particular place of prayer, uh, that I would spend many, many hours with the Lord. And it's overlooking this valley. There's a big mountain. I can see the city of Melbourne very much in the distance. But it was a time I spent with God, so, uh, a heap of time with the Lord. And, um, and I wanted to go back there before I headed here, just to, be, just to spend that last time. And no doubt, Jesus is now um, bringing these fond memories back to the disciples. And then he goes and they get to Bethany on the Mount of Olives, And in verses 50 and 51 of uh, Luke 24, it says, While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. What a beautiful picture. What a beautiful picture. No doubt they would have seen Jesus' hands lifted up many times when he stilled the water and he then declared to them, You have little faith. And they saw, Wow, this truly is God. They saw him, perhaps, certainly John, maybe the other disciples as well, with his hands stretched out upon the cross. And now Jesus stands over them to give them one last image of the altogether resurrected Christ standing over and blessing his people. This is not an image of Jesus on the cross dying. This is not an image of Jesus in the tomb um, dead. Uh, This is not even an image of him resurrected. It's an image of him standing and blessing his people. Basically to say, I love you, I died for you, And now I send you out with the expectancy of the coming Holy Spirit to go with my gospel and my blessing and my power. That is the view that they would have had as they left that that Christ, as he was taken up into heaven. He had conquered the grave um, and he bestows a blessing on them. And he goes up. And were they disappointed when he goes up? No, because it says in verse 52 of Luke, And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. They could believe the words of Christ now. That in the upper room, he said, 
don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. I'm going to go and prepare a place for you and I'll come again. So no doubt, all this has come true. And as he goes up, they leave and say, we're going to get, get back to business. And then another thing to note in uh, the Acts passage in verse 9, that a cloud covers him as he goes up. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. This is none other than the Shekinah glory. When God presented himself before the people in the Old Testament, he would come down in a cloud upon the tabernacle or temple and to show his blessing, his dwelling with the people. And, it's, and remembering in the transfiguration, Jesus was enveloped in cloud to show his glory and to show the presence of God. He was taken up to be received by the Father back into the presence of the Father. And then what happens? Two men dressed in white. And they say, they say, um, what do you stand here looking up into the sky for? Why are you standing here looking up? In now, don't you think this is a strange question to ask? Perhaps you would say, well, what, what do you think we're standing here looking up into the sky for? We've just seen Christ go up. We're, we're perhaps waiting to see maybe he'll come down again. But they, he says, um, what do you stand here? Perhaps it's to, to say this. You've got work to do now. Don't just stand there looking up into the sky. You have work to do. You have an appointment to keep. It's an, it's an immediate reminder for them, to, for, for, the, for them to realize, don't make the Mount of Olives a shrine to God who is resurrected. No, he has gone up. He's not dead. He lives to come again, he's doing his work, but you have work to do. Go and do it. You know your marching orders. Go to Jerusalem, get the Holy Spirit, and go and be my witnesses. Just don't watch, but be obedient. And this tells us, I think, something of the task for us today. There are many people who spend much of their time looking to see when will Christ return? What are the times? What are the signs? I think, what would Christ say to that? Uh, no, we, and, and perhaps the, the, the white men would, or the men dressed in white would stand there to us and say, what are you doing? Trying to work it out. Well, you don't know. Um, this is appointed by the Father, um, when, and we do not know. Uh, but what are you doing? Spending all your time. You have work to do. Go and do it. And so we see the ascension observed. But then let's look at the ascension explained. So why is the ascension so important? It's interesting to note in, uh, over the page in Acts 2 that the first message that we have from anyone after Christ is ascended is, it's a, it's a message that mentions the ascension in the gospel message from Peter because it says in verses uh, 30, let's say 32, chapter 2, and it says, uh, this Jesus God raised up, and of that we are witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. He's saying this ascension is crucial for our Christian understanding. He is now exalted at the right hand of God. The first point under the ascension explained is that it ensures that the Holy Spirit will come to his people will come to his people and we can see that in verses uh, 4 and 5 chapter 1 and while staying with them he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem but to wait for the promise of the father which he said you heard from me for John baptized with water but we, you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now so one of the most important reasons for Jesus ascension was that Pentecost might take place that the father and the son might pour out the spirit his spirit upon the church and to strengthen the church and empower the people for missions these Peter didn't stand there in his own strength talking about uh, the resurrected ascended Christ he stood there in the strength of the Holy Spirit that he would then go out and preach the gospel and if it wasn't I mean, there's many benefits to having the Holy Spirit, of course, but if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit working right now, I would not be even here. Uh, my words would be meaningless because I would have no power to convert the dead souls in front of me, as I was at one stage. 
Because we, the scriptures say, are dead in our sins. And how would we possibly become alive? It is when the Holy Spirit convicts your heart to understand the gravity of your situation and that Christ is indeed Lord and King over all and that we must be subservient to him. It will only be by the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And if the Holy Spirit does not work through this message or cannot work, then I might as well not be up here because they would just simply be words. But no, I am with confidence, just as Peter was, that the Holy Spirit is indeed working, that the Holy Spirit does come upon believers, and it is the assurance that they will one day, they are united to Christ and will one day be with him in glory. Second point is, it confirms Jesus' continued work. Notice in verse 1, In the first book, O Theophilus, I dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. This is remarkable. What does the word began mean? Well, it means what you think it means, to initiate an action or a process. Think about this. Paul, sorry, Luke states that I've, my first work was to tell you about what actually, what Jesus began to do. But hang on, wasn't, he's 33 years on this earth, dying on the, on the cross, being resurrected, wasn't that it? No, that is just simply the beginning. We have an eternity to go for Christ to continue to do his work. He is working now. He worked then, yes, but that's only the beginning of Christ's work. He said, this is what he began to do. He now is ascended. I want to tell you what he will continue to do as Lord and Messiah. So the Acts of the Apostles could really be renamed the Acts of the Risen Lord Jesus. This is Christ's work continually going on now in the Acts of the Apostles and continues to go on in your life now and will continue to go on forever. Christ just began his work when he came as a man. It will continue to go. The third point, it inaugurates Jesus' enthronement as king. This is an interesting point. I want you to get this. It it, it inaugurates Jesus' enthronement as king in the council of chalcedon in 451 ad they declared rightly that christ was truly man and truly god having two natures in one person so jesus did not now notice this two natures in one per, one person this is remarkable before that before christ came on this earth we had the trinity in spirit only. Now, there is a transform, a change, if you will, or an addition to that Trinity when the second person of the Trinity takes on human flesh. But he did not just take on human flesh for 33 years and dispense with that human flesh when he was resurrected. He took his human flesh up into heaven. Have you ever thought about this? He said, touch me and see, for it is not... for." A spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. In John 1.14, it says, The word became flesh. It wasn't just a human costume. To think that uh, it is just a human facade with deity inside. No, this is Christ. One man, two natures, never to change again. He's united as our brother in human flesh. This is Remarkable. He is the, Colossians 1.15, the image of the invisible God. He is forever joined, he joined our humanity to his divinity for all eternity to be fully God and fully man. Meaning this, that the, the, the cross is no afterthought. It's not a plan B. This is before all eternity. Christ was going to come as a man and unite himself to the image bearers and be united for all eternity. But let me ask you, is there a difference in Christ's reigning as king before his coming and compared to after his coming? Is there a difference? Well, one clear difference is that Christ ascended to heaven as a man, not just as a spirit. What does that mean? Well, it would seem that he is now reigning as a human divine 
God, Christ, having won the right to rule the world of which, to rule the nations which he purchased. If Christ is primarily reigning just as a spirit, which, which we do not want to divide Christ, uh, how could it be said that, he has, that God has given him authority over the world? And we only have to go to Psalm 2 to realize that for Christ's resurrection and ascension, actually he gained the nations of the world in some form that he did not have. It says in verse 7 of chapter 2 of Psalm, I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. And this has confounded many of the early church. What does it mean that the son has been begotten? Was there a time when he wasn't? Is he under the father? Well, no, it can't be. It does mean that he begotten in the sense that he became a man, he was resurrected, because then it says, ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. So this means that when Christ raised from the earth, the Father gave him the nations to rule forever over the nations as a human divine. So Christ stands there now, seated at the right hand of God, in human divine form over all the nations of this earth right now. That's why he is able to say in Matthew 28, 18, all authority in heaven and on earth has now been given to me, has been given to me. I thought he had it, didn't he? Wasn't he already over all the nations of this earth? Well, let's look at this, the temptation of Satan. Remember, tem- Satan tempted Jesus and said, To you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. Satan is saying to Jesus, you don't have to go to the cross to get the nations, to rule the nations. I will give it to you, because they were Satan's at the fall of Adam. If the temptation was not real, well, Jesus would have said, well, I already own the nations. But in the sense of his human, divine um, form, having been the seed of David in the kingly line of David, he didn't rule the nations. But his resurrection confirmed that he defeated sin and death and God gave him the nations of the earth. And so now when Jesus says at the Great Commission, I have obtained the nations through my death and resurrection, through my resurrection and ascension. Now go because they're mine. Do you see? That we, that, that we have a ruler who is above all rulers because he has resurrected and ascended, having bought the nations, having received them from the Father. So when you look at the rulers of today, whether it be Obama or, or or head of Australia, or, um, or anyone. Friends, they will be, they are here today, they'll be gone tomorrow. But Christ's kingship rules on, for he secured the nations. I think of Stalin at the, during the Second World War. He said, I will not stop until I make the name of God a name of a bygone era. <laughs> Where is Stalin now? He's in the grave. Christ, though, stands sits at the right hand of God on the throne over all the nations. And chapter 2 of Psalm chapter 2, the nations don't like that and they, they push at that. And it says that, that he who sits in the heavens laughs at those earthly rulers who try and set themselves up against the Lord and against his anointed. Do you see the necessity of the ascension? He ascended to take on that human kingship that he will forever have. Fourth thing, it establishes Jesus' advocacy for his people. Hebrews 9, 24. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. He is now the perfect, not only the king, but the perfect high priest who has ascended into the holy presence of the Father, to present himself as the final sacrifice to sin. He is our human 
advocate and appeals to the Father on our behalf. Notice this, that Satan is called the accuser. Jesus is called the advocate. Satan is, the, is called the accuser of the brethren before the Father. Jesus is called the advocate of the brethren before the Father. So, Satan tells you, you sin. You deserve to be punished. You are guilty. You have broken God's commands. And he is very upset with you. And he stands between you and God and says, this one is guilty. The advocate, Jesus, the great high priest, stands and says, after Satan has sat, taken his seat in the courtroom of God, stands and says, what Satan has said is true regarding what this one has done. Yes, he has broken your law, almighty God, Father. But he cannot be guilty. He cannot be guilty because... No, sorry, he cannot be guilty. And what Satan is saying is not a lie. Yes, he's broken the law. He cannot be guilty because the sin that he has, has done has been atoned for. It is called expiation, has been expired. He cannot be guilty because I have taken the full brunt of that man's punishment or that woman's punishment. No guilt remains. I've paid the debt in full. That's what the high priest does, final sacrifice. And so the accuser can only go with his tail between his legs. That is why the hymn says, Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me right now, pleading for you because of the guilt that is in your heart. You are not guilty now, even though the, Satan is accusing you day and night before the Father, but the advocate, the great high priest, stands there and saying, not guilty, paid in full, it's all complete. Only the ascended Christ can do that. The fifth point, it ensures Jesus' return. The men in white were saying, basically this, he has gone up. You are not in the world alone now. It's not like Jesus has just simply left and has gone away to one day come back again and doing nothing up in, the, up in heaven for us. I mean, that would be worse than having no God at all. A God that has just gone and left, wound up this earth to let it run its course. No, it's not. According to Bette Midler, God is watching us from a distance as if God is just letting us do what we want to do. I would hate to think what that would be like. Um, the very fact that we have order, um, and I've said the very fact that we even have the sun shining today is by the grace of God that none of us deserve. No, he has not left us. He will, it says, come again in the same way that he left and that is why Jesus said in the, um, in the upper room before he went to the cross, he said, uh, do not let your hearts be troubled. troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many rooms. If it were not so, I would not have told you that I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. I am the Son, Jesus says, and I'm going to the Father to open up the door to prepare a place in the Father's home because I have a right as the Son and I will bring you to myself. I stand there advocating for you, ruling the nations, but opening up a place for you and I will, just as surely as I went, I will come again. This gives us, the fact that he's gone assures us that he is, will come again. The ascension is necessary for that to occur. The ascension observed, the ascension explained, now the ascension applied. What does that mean for us? And no doubt there was a few applications through what we've just discussed. The ascension is extremely important to our understanding as it pertains to our life. It is not just simply a piece of theological ballast which we can just throw overboard in our lives. It's necessary as I hope you've understood. The ascension... <coughs> gives believers security in an insecure world. Gives believers security in an insecure world. I think too many of us 
live as though Jesus was still in the tomb. The disciples were in disarray between his death and resurrection. But once Christ ascended, it states, they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. Why? Because he was alive, yes. But more than that, Jesus had ascended to take the place to rule the nations. So as far as the disciples were concerned, the whole world could be in disarray. The whole world could be against them. But if Christ is for me, that's all I need because Christ is ruling the whole world. You know, we see many events on TV. You see ISIS. You see um, the, the, the state of um, financial state, um, jobs in, 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 a, in America. There is me- much to make us perplexed. But so many of us live as if Jesus is not ruling upon the throne. No, he's ascended to take up that rulership. Might not be, things might not be working out the way we think it is, but we should be above all people, the most peaceful, the most satisfied, the most confident people in all the world. You only have to see something that goes on uh, overseas, uh, such as a terrorist attack, and people just are in disarray. We don't know what's going on. When we've got Christ, we're settled. We're trusting. Death is truly only that stepping stone into glory. You know, we hold on to this world as if, with our nails if it, as, as if it's the only thing we have. Getting older and older and doing everything we can to slow down this aging process. People spend every effort they can. No. We, we need to believe what Paul said. He said, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Now, these are some pretty big things. Shall tribulation, distress, persecution... Well, if I speak the word, they'll persecute me. Nothing will separate us from him. Or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or the sword. No, in all things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. In Christ, we have security in an insecure world. The ascended, the ascension proclaims the rule and reign of Christ. So whatever your circumstances, Christ is reigning and ruling over them. And nothing, nothing can touch your life, whether it's a person, whether it's words, whether it's physical, mental, without it going through the hand of Christ first. And him saying, this is for your good and my glory. He has the authority and he uses that authority. Second point with the ascension applied, it gives believers comfort in the midst of, of suffering. Hebrews 4:14. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Notice this, that describes the ascension, does it not? Passed through the heavens, Jesus the son of God, let us hold fast the confession of our faith. He's passed through the heavens. Christ has carried our humanity or his humanity into heaven into the Godhead. Basically, the Godhead is now possessed, um, possessed, as it were, with humanity, or now possesses humanity. There is now humanity in the Godhead. The Godhead has a human heart. You ever thought of that? Human heart. And Jesus Christ looks down on our sufferings, our deep depression, our loneliness, and reaches into our lives. And the scars on his hands are evidence of his care and his identification with you in your sorrows, whatever they are. He is the only one who truly cares and the only one who truly understands. And like the song, when when we shall see him, we will recognize him by the nail prints in his hands. Aligning to your sorrows, aligning himself, caring and understanding. Third point, gives us the command to be ready. The ascension gives us the command to be ready. The men in white said, this Jesus, this Jesus, the one whom you felt, whom you touched, the one who ate food, has gone up into heaven. The one who commissioned you and he will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So what is the way 
that we want Christ to meet us when he comes back again. Have you thought about that? If it's the same Christ that's gone up, then let us be doing what he was doing before he went. If you want to meet him with great joy, then we better be serving him with earnestness. If Jesus were to come back today, what would you want him to find you doing? I wonder how much of our time is spent on useless things, things that not neither good nor bad, just useless, meaningless, not good for the kingdom, not good for anyone. I wonder if you're spending more time on this sort of stuff and will Christ say to you, well done, my good and faithful servant. When we're doing not bad, not good, just useless, wasteful. We should be busy about his business. Oh, but, but pastor, I, I need time. I need time to rest. Just chill out. You don't need time away from Christ. You need time with Christ. What did Jesus do when he, when he was tired, worn? What does it say in, I think, um, Mark 1, I think, that he left the disciples. He had a massive day. He left them, got up before it was light. He went to a lonely place and there went to the Father and prayed. He doesn't need less of God, the Father. He needs more of God. We don't need less of Christ. We need more of him. Don't be busy doing other things. Be ready for Christ. Not looking up, oh God, I'm seeing these different aspects. You're going to be coming back. No, just busy doing his work. The last thing and the most important thing with regards to the application It gives us the opportunity for salvation. Hebrews 7.25. Consequently, he is able to save to the utmost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. He always lives to make intercession for them. Every time that the word of God is presented, just like it has now, it creates a crossroads in your heart and your mind. It puts a sword, it divides. In what respect? In this respect, that all that I've just spoken about is true for the believer with regards to his rulership that we can be confident in. In regards to his, um, his advocacy, his coming again for his people. But for those who are not his children, they are not true for him. When he shall sound... When he shall come with trumpet sound, O may I then in him be found, in him my righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. Faultless to stand before the throne. As surely as you sit here before me now, you will one day stand before the gates of heaven and God will say, what right do you have to be here? And only one answer will swing back those gates of heaven. And it will not come from you but it will come from the Son to the Father who will say this, Father, with great respect, this one's with me. Only those words will swing back the gates of heaven, faultless to stand before the throne. But if you sit here now and Christ is not advocating on your behalf, if Satan is accusing, well, he doesn't need to accuse you because you're accused already. But if he is not standing, advocating on your behalf, then ultimately you are without God and without hope. And the ascension is a terrible, terrible truth laid out in Scripture. Because the ascension is not something to be joyful over. The ascension is something to be fearful over. Standing there, sitting there as ruler in the nations with the certainty of coming back again to judge the nations. And so I simply say to you, if he cannot stand and advocate on your behalf now because you have not given your life to him, you have not submitted to this king who is the king of kings and lord of lords, and we will know one day if he cannot do that, then I plead with you and say to you, give up your arms against him. Don't stand in opposition against him. He is the one who has won the nations and we need to be subservient to him and plead with him that he might grant us repentance for the saving of our souls. 
let's pray and commit the Lord, commit to the Lord. And I'll ask the, those praying, those prayer partners to come up as we're praying. If you are in this precarious position that only one thing stops you from going into all eternity and that is death which could happen the moment you walk out of this place. You need to do business with the Lord. You need uh, to submit your life to him. And I would ask that after this message, after this prayer, that you'd come down and speak to one of these people who is coming down now. Uh, Lord, I pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit would convict the hearts. Convict the hearts of unbelievers, Lord, that they stand in opposition to you, even though they might have come in here self-satisfied. Lord, let them leave satisfied in you and not now self-satisfied. And Lord, for us as believers, Lord, we worship you, we glorify you, uh, that our sufficiency is in you, our righteousness is in you, Christ, and that you stand there interceding for us right now and that you rule the nations, that nothing can come upon us without it going through your hands. Lord, this should give us confidence. May we live this day and the days come in uh, with this confidence, joyful in these facts and not downcast, Lord. And may we be able to share such good news to others. We thank you. And Lord, may we be found faithful doing your work the moment we leave this place. In Jesus' name.